Hey folks, Tim Newman with Softlight Studios. Sorry you haven't seen me for about a week or so. Haven't felt the best, but uh, feel like I'm uh, getting past that now. And uh, while I was a little laid up, I worked on something that I thought was really important that I think you guys will find pretty exciting. It's a three-part series all about color and how we see it, how we perceive it, a little bit of the theory behind it, how we manage it, and ultimately how we control output. Let's jump right in and get started. Color theory, color space, and color management. Understanding and managing color. From camera to editing software, to in-house printing, to service bureau output, effective color management is critical to getting the best, most consistent results from any output device. In this presentation, I want to clear up some of the confusion and misconceptions that exist about color theory, color capture in digital images, and managed digital output. Part 1. Color Theory Let's start off by looking at color in the world around us, how it is transmitted, how the human eye sees it, how it's captured digitally, and ultimately, how it is perceived. Our exploration starts off with our taking a look at the radiation waves that surround us on a daily basis, all the way from gamma rays at their incredibly short 10,000th of a nanometer wavelength to AM radio waves at their relatively long 100 meter wavelength. In the middle of this spectrum of radiation waves, lies the visible spectrum of light. And as we take a look at this visible spectrum of light, we see a range of wavelengths running from roughly 400 nanometers in length to about 700 nanometers in length. In fact, as we push over that 700 nanometers in length, we begin to fall into the range that we think of as infrared light. Now, one of the things that you should notice looking at this spectrum on the top here, is that the colors in this rainbow are not what we think of as evenly distributed. As we inspect this spectrum of light up here, we notice on the left-hand side a heavy preponderance of shades of purple, sandwiching a very narrow blue and cyan range before it jumps into a fairly wide band of greens. And then again, those greens sandwich a very narrow band of yellow light before ending up into a wide swath of saturated reds to the right. Now, if we look at the lower half of this diagram, we see what we would call a perceptually uniform spectrum of white light. And in order to get that perceptually uniform spectrum of that white light, you'll notice that we've had to either contract or expand various ranges in those nanometer wavelengths to the bottom in order to get that uniform rainbow that we expect to see. So now that we understand the variable quality of those colors that exist around us, let's take a look at how we actually process and perceive them. The first thing that we're going to take a look at is the human eye and how the human eye captures and perceives color. The human eye is a remarkably complex organ, starting off with the cornea and the lens out front and the pupil that constricts or opens up to allow more light into the eyeball, all the way back to a very fine network of arteries and veins at the back and the optive, optic nerve at the back carrying signals out. But most importantly for this discussion, the retina, the thin layer that exists at the back of the eyeball that actually processes the light and more importantly the colors coming in through the cornea and the lens. If we take a look at that retina in detail, you'll notice that among other things, the retina is made up of red cones, green cones, and blue cones. It's those cones in the retina that are sensitive to wavelengths of red, green, or blue light. And it's the combination 
of what those cones see being mixed together that gives the human eye and subsequently the human brain the ability to discern colors. Now, let's take a look at the digital sensor that resides in most of our digital cameras and think about how that works as well. The digital sensor is basically a grid of pixels. And if you had, for example, a 6,000 pixel by 4,000 pixel digital sensor, that would give you that 24 megapixel sensor that we think of in traditional terms. Now, each of those pixels that you see here in this sensor are simply buckets that capture levels of light. And those levels of light can go anywhere from zero, basically black, not seeing any light, up to, in the case of, say, a 14-bit digital camera, 4,096 levels or photons of light that were captured in that pixel. So basically, every single one of these pixel locations that you see here is an individual bucket that captures levels of light or in editing terms, luminosity. Now, this digital sensor has no notion of color. It simply processes those levels of light that we referred to. Color comes in the form of filters that sit over the top of the sensor. You can see here that in very specific positions, there are red filters, and those red filters allow only red light to penetrate into that pixel position. So even though that pixel position is only processing luminosity, it's processing red luminosity. You'll notice in other positions, there are green filters, and correspondingly, they only let green light penetrate through to the sensor locations. And then last but not least, there are these blue filters that sit in other locations that allow blue light to come through. So if you take all of these and put them together, you end up with what is known as the Bayer Filter Array, developed by Dr. Bayer of Kodak Labs. So in each of those four grouped pixel locations, we have a red filter, two green filters, and a blue filter. And it's the combination of that red, green, and blue light that the camera later assembles into a shade of color, a brightness or saturation of that color, and a luminosity level. The demosaicing algorithm, as it's known, is what's responsible for taking those red, green, and blue light luminance levels and turning them into the color pixels that we expect to see in the picture, almost in the exact way that the cones in the human eye process the spectrum of colors that it sees. Now that we understand how both the human eye and the digital sensor process color in the world around us, let's dig a little deeper into color theory. When we dig into color theory, there are a number of things that we want to take a look at. And while some of this seems a little complex on the surface, understanding this will go a tremendously long way in your post-production editing efforts. The first thing that we want to think about is the color wheel. The color wheel or color circle was first offered by Sir Isaac Newton in 1666, and it provides a structured observation of the relationship between colors, and it is still universally used today. Next, we're gonna take a look at color harmony. The interaction between colors and the visual aesthetic of that interaction of colors is called color harmony, and there are specific color relationships that be, can be used to achieve specific harmonious results. The last thing that we're going to take a look at here is a notion called color context. The perception of color is altered based upon its proximity to other colors and even shapes around it. Color context explores those relationships and their effect upon your images. In order to dig into color theory, a little bit deeper. We want to understand the color models that exist in both the printing and digital world. The subtractive color model is based upon white light 
being reflected off of a pigmented surface, i.e. ink. That color that is not absorbed or subtracted from that surface is the color that we perceive upon viewing that surface. So you think of a white piece of paper with ink printed on that white piece of paper. Those inks are absorbing out of white light all of the colors that ultimately we are not going to see. White in subtractive color typically serves as the substrate for the application of pigments. Most offset press printing is done on white paper stock. Those pigments that are on that paper stock absorb specific colors from light and allow select colors to be reflected back to the viewer. In subtractive color, black serves as the absence of all light and therefore all color. Additionally, it can represent total absorption of all colors in reflected light. If you think of a white piece of paper with black ink on it, that black ink is absorbing all of the colors in the spectrum and not reflecting any colors back to you. Let's take a look at the color wheels in the subtractive color model. Our primary colors of yellow, red, and blue are basically the three pigment colors that are thought of as not being able to be made up or blended from other colors. These are base colors that we start with. Our secondary colors in that subtractive color wheel are those colors that are created by blending any two of the primary colors together. So you can see if we blend yellow and red together, we would expect to get orange. Blue and red together, we would expect to get magenta and so far. And now, five minutes into the video, I've taken you back to kindergarten art class. Last but not least, our tertiary colors are colors that are created by blending a primary color with its adjacent secondary color. Now, it's interesting to note these relationships in both of the color models that you're about to see because they define a very clear positional and mathematical relationship in the color wheel. And that can be used to your advantage in editing in a number of different ways. Now, let's jump over into the additive color model. So far, we've looked at the subtractive color model. And in the subtractive color model, we're thinking of things that are printed on a substrate like paper or vinyl or cloth or whatever. And they are subtracting colored light out of that white light spectrum. The additive color model is the color model that comes into play anytime we're thinking about creating a picture on a digital camera or on a computer screen or on a projector. And that additive color model is based upon the absence of all light with primary colors being added to create the colors that we wish to be displayed. In that additive color model, we think of white as the result of all three primary colors being displayed and blended together at 100% intensity. In the additive color model, the substrate is typically black. Think of the display screen on the back of your camera or your computer monitor. When they're off, they're black. In the additive color model, black serves as the absence of all light and therefore all color, very similar to the subtractive color model, but conversely, it does not representation the absorption of light rather the total lack of light. Now, with that color model in mind of additive color, let's take a look at the color wheel for additive color. Our primary colors are different. They're made up of red, green, and blue. The typical colors that we think of in digital photography, RGB. And again, those are the colors that we typically think of as not being able to be made up of or blended from other colors. Our secondary colors, what in the additive color model we refer to as subtractive primaries, 
are primary colors that have been blended together, but by their being blended together, they are in fact subtracting some of that primary color from each side, leaving that secondary color in the middle. And then last but not least in the additive color model, we again have tertiary colors, but they are created by altering the blend ratios between the primary colors being blended. In other words, all tertiary colors are made up by changing the ratio of the two primary colors that are being blended together. Now that we have a solid handle on the additive and subtractive color wheels, let's take a look at color harmony. Specific relationships between colors in color sets provide the basis for color harmony. With these harmonies eliciting attributes to the colors contained within a scene, relationships can make colors more or less dramatic, alter the overall mood or tone of the frame, and evoke emotions from within the viewer. Note, color harmonies can be readily found in nature, and mimicking their color relationships can evoke calm, serene emotions. Conversely, color harmonies can also be thought of as man-made, and those color relationships and the usage of those harmonies can evoke emotions engage viewers, and even mimic cultural color biases. Let's explore color harmony a little bit deeper. Here is a complementary color set and a sample picture where you can see those complementary colors being used and how readily that they play off one another in the frame. At a little bit more subtle yet still powerful perspective is the monochromatic color harmony. And that is a picture that contains nothing but tones of that color that's been picked there, as you can see in this yellow pepper shot that exists here. Uh, a little bit more on the sophisticated side, we have what we call analogous color harmonies. And analogous color harmonies can be colors that are banded together rel relatively close to one another on the color wheel or widely spread out as you see here in this pepper shot. But you can see the very careful relationship going around the color wheel that builds what we call this analogous color harmony. All the way to split complementary color harmonies, which use complex combinations of colors to come up with really cohesive scenes like you see here in this sample picture. Last but not least, let's take a look at color context. Tones and colors are affected by the tones and colors that surround them. Color context provides valuable insight into seeing light in color in both captures out in the field and output. As you can see here in these two sample images, the rectangles or squares that sit in the centers of these frames look like they are in fact two different shades of gray, but in all reality, they are both exactly 50% grayscale. It's their surrounding environment that changes your perception of how they look. Background colors can have a dramatic effect on the colors that sit in the foreground such as you see here in this example image where the various background colors change your perception of that red accent color sitting in the foreground. One can find examples of foreground color shifts that range from very subtle. As you can see in this set of sample images here, where you might notice, depending on the quality of your computer monitor that you're viewing this presentation from, that these two light purple squares look different from one another. Maybe the one at the upper left is shaded a little bit redder than the one in the lower right. But in fact, when we connect the two together, we can see that they are indeed one tone. People that study optical illusions can take this to an extreme, and you can see just by changing what color sits in the foreground versus what color sits in the background. You can make that yellow circle in the center look dramatically different, even though I can assure you it's exactly the same shade in both of those sample images. As we wrap up here, 
Here's one more optical illusion that shows you the interplay of background colors and foreground colors. And if you're looking at this, you'll clearly note that these little yellow dots sitting on top of this grid look to be shifting from yellow to green as you move your eye around the frame. But in fact, they're not. It's just how you perceive the interaction of these colors. One last thought here when we think about how we perceive colors as you look at this sample image is to note that what looks to you on the screen as being an image made up of three different blended colors is actually a picture that contains a million unique colors, but you'd never gather that by looking at the frame that you see here. All right, folks, that wraps up part one of this series. Stay tuned. In the next part of this series, I will explore color spaces and how they can be easily and effectively used to control color output on a wide variety of output devices. Well, there you have it, folks. Part one in our three-part series on color theory, color space, and color management. Hopefully you enjoyed part one. Stay tuned. Part two and part three will be coming at you soon. In the meantime, I hope you're staying uh, safely locked indoors and uh, staying healthy. See you out there. Thank <laughs> you.